Second reading this morning is from the Gospel of John. Jesus is with his disciples and speaking to them. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandment and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer, because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends, because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my Father. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And would you pray with me? Gracious God, we thank you that you have the privilege of gathering this morning. And we ask that in this time you would quiet every voice but your own. Quiet those noisy voices outside of us. And quiet the noisy and anxious voices inside of us. So that we might hear your voice and receive and understand your word for us today. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So what comes to mind when you hear the word friend? Or maybe who comes to mind? What images, what pictures, what qualities, what experiences, friend? The word friend. Or maybe a song comes to mind when you're down and troubled and you need a helping hand. You know, James Taylor, Carol King, you've got a friend. Or more recently, a Toy Story, you've got a friend in me, friend in me, and all those five sequels. Friend, a friend. What is friendship and how does it happen? The word friend, I think we all know it, but a definition may help us. One dictionary said, a friend is one who is attached to another by affection, or esteem, or a feeling of personal regard. Some of the synonyms for friend include these, an ally, associate, chum, comrade, confident, sidekick, bosom buddy, pal, amigo. Remember that great classic movie, The Three Amigos? An Urban Dictionary describes a friend as someone you trust and like enough to hang out with on a regular basis. That about sums it up. Trust and hanging out together. Our son Peter, who's now 38, when he was a boy, he loved his friends and he actually made a list of his best friends, 10 best friends, in descending order. Thankfully, he did not share that with anybody. (laughs) But over his life, he has made many friends. He's a generous, open-spirited young man. You know him. He has three children now and a teacher up in Virginia. But when he was eight or nine, and Andy and I had moved from Washington, D.C. to Decatur, Georgia, so I could attend theological seminary, Peter hooked up with a couple of other little boys, two of whom were from Wales. And their name was, were Griffith and Meredith uh, Russell Jones. Their father, Ewan, had been with the BBC and was teaching a course 
at Columbia Seminary. We became friends. Well, they formed a club like Nancy did, but it wasn't the Happy Faces Club. They called themselves the Chums. With well, the British, you know, the way up rush, the Chums. I don't remember all of the requirements to get into the club or to stay in the club. I, I do remember one of them was you had to do something gross once a week. <laughs> and they had a motto or a theme, and it was this, always take the adventurous way. Hey, think about that. Boys who are seven, eight, always take the adventurous way. Isn't that so cool? Wouldn't you want to be a chum with those guys? Pals, buddies, chums. By the way, do you know what you call a boat full of buddies? A friendship. <laughs> do you know what the best vitamin for a friendship is? Somebody at the early service got this. What's the best vitamin for friendship? B1. You were here at the first service. <laughs> B, B1, barking with... <laughs> uh, but there's some more colorful definitions or examples of friendship. T try these. A true friend is someone who thinks you are a good egg even though she knows you're slightly cracked. <laughs> Oscar Wilde said this. A true friend will stab you in the front. Here's a good one. Friendship is a wildly underrated medication. Now that, I think, is worth thinking about. There's nothing better than a friend unless it's a friend with chocolate. <laughs> and then finally this from that great philosopher Groucho Marx. When you are in jail, a good friend will be trying to bail you out. A best friend will be in the cell next to you saying, damn, that was fun. <laughs> Maybe that takes you back to your college days. I don't know. <laughs> the lighter side of friendship. But what is the state of friendship today? You know, there are a lot of studies that have come out recently about loneliness. Loneliness. And the CDC defines loneliness as an emotion that comes from a lack of social connection. It's only increased in the pandemic. Isolation. We're built for community and connection. Now, the Harvard Graduate School of Education survey 2021 found that 36 of all Americans feel lonely. 61% of young adults feel lonely. And 43% of young adults have felt an increase in loneliness with 63% experiencing anxiety or depression. And then here's a striking statistic. 54% of adult Americans report that not a single person knows them well. Wow. Wow. Columbia University has found that the incidence of loneliness has gone up 50% since 1970. And some of the contributing factors may include a change in family structure and location, longer lives with experiencing a high rate of loss of significant others in old age. Some of us in our men's group have talked about that, losing friends. A, an environment that fosters independence and isolation and individualism and, and the weakening of social institutions, local institutions that strengthened social capital. And finally, the way that the internet is used by young adults and I would say by older adults as well. Loneliness, an article, thank you George Craig for this, this week, 85 year Harvard study on happiness found that what people missed most in retirement was not the work, but the relationships. One doctor was asked, what do you miss most? Responded, absolutely nothing about the work itself. I miss the people and friendships. What about you? You know, when I was in my 30s and a young lawyer, dad of three, 
Life was good. But I found myself one night at the top of the stairs, sitting there in Vienna, Virginia, in our home, and I'm saying, where are all my friends? What, what happened to my friends? Those guys I knew, college, played sports with. And I thought, you know, where did they go? What do I need to do? So anyway, I ran into one of them, a friend, Mark. We were playing touch football with a group, and he had come to faith at Yale Business School, of all places. And we got together, we started talking, and then we had lunch, and then said, you know what, this is so good, let's have a once a week Bible study. We invited some other men. And what we found, and you know this to be true, is that once you take off the mask of self-sufficiency in a safe place with friends, there is a bonding and a love that happens that is so powerful and so compelling. And that's what happened to me in that small group of men. And I'll tell you, that group is still meeting by Zoom. I'm not part of it, but 35 years later, once, once a week, once a week. G.K. Chesterton, British Christian and philosopher, said there are no words to express the abyss between isolation and having one ally. It may be conceded to the mathematician that four is twice two, but two is not twice one. Two is 2,000 times one. Scripture today, thank you, Karen, for reading. Two are better than one. If one falls in a ditch, the other can lift him or her up. Jesus, the Gospel of John says, I no longer call you servants. I call you friends. If you do what I command, now that sounds kind of harsh, if you do what I command. But what did he command them to do? To love one another as I have loved you. That is our calling as friends of Jesus and as friends of each other. Victoria Atkinson White is a pastor. She's now with Duke Divinity School focusing on leadership education. She's written a recent book entitled Holy Friendships, Nurturing Relationships That Sustain Pastors and Leaders. I read an excerpt of the book in the email that comes from Duke uh, recently. And her point is that leaders and all of us need friends. She calls them holy friends, not because they're holier or better, holier than thou, but, but holy meaning set apart. These are distinctive friendships, Christian friendships. And she describes them as mutual and sacred relationships deeply founded in God's love. And she goes on to say that such friendships will validate our past hold space for us in our present and help us midwife a vision for the future. So as to the past, friends helping us re-narrate our experiences. How often have you looked back with regret? And maybe you open yourself up enough to share with a friend and they listen to you and they say, well, you know what? What, what is happening there? Maybe there's a different way of looking at it. Maybe, maybe God is at work even in this hard thing. Or holding space, that image, in the present, creating an unconditional safe space where we're confident we can be vulnerable as our authentic selves, warts and all, frail human beings, listened to without judgment. Now, she goes on to describe a friendship which she has with a woman named Jean. And I'm going to read a little bit about how that friendship works. She writes this, My holy friend Jean and I have a code word for holding space for each other. The word is basket. If I am the one requesting the basket, Jean will call me and will have an intentionally one-sided conversation in which Jean holds space for me, a metaphorical basket. I like to think of it as a large laundry basket. I spew out anything and everything on my mind in a run-on sentence, a cathartic rant. I'm as vulnerable as I choose to be. Jean may let me know she's listening or make 
Empathetic sounds like, "Uh uh-huh, or oh, wow, or that sounds hard. She doesn't question my rationality or logic. She doesn't ask for more details. She listens without judgment and holds the basket while I dump in everything that is bothering me. As I proceed from topic to topic, I begin to feel lighter and less burdened because Jean is holding all my thoughts, feelings, and frustrations in the moment. And as I feel lighter, I often gain clarity and discern solutions to some of my problems and then describe them out loud. At this point, I usually feel calmer, more thoughtful, clearer about a way to move forward with authenticity, intentionality, and focus. My basket may still be heavy, but because Jean held it for me while I made sense of its contents, I have a better idea of what is in it, what my priorities should be, and what my next right steps need to be. Most often, I only need her to be present and listen while I talk. Holding space for one another with unconditional love, listening without judgment. Faithful friends. Now, she also talks about the future and how faithful friends or holy friends push us to dream bigger, aim higher, trust God more freely than we would on our own, that they help us address the gap between who we feel we are and what God is calling us to be or to do. And, you know, I see that time and time again here in this congregation where folks step forward like this morning to join this church or maybe you've been called to be a deacon and an elder. You think, oh, I can't do that. I'm not worthy. And then you say yes and the spirit moves and the friends encourage and lo and behold, you become an instrument, a vessel of God's love here in this place because we're all undergirded by an understanding of the never-ending, ever-flowing, overwhelming love of God and of our own frail and vulnerable and imperfect humanity like we pray every week in the confession, knowing that we all fall short, and yet, despite that, or maybe even because of it, we know that God can use us as vessels of God's love. The bulletin cover, just take a look at it if you would. It is from our St. John's Bible, and I hope if you haven't had a chance to see this wonderful work of sacred art, you can come up afterwards or come Wednesday night or Wednesday at the organ concert. We'll have some volumes out for you. But this is from the book of Sirach, which is actually not in the Protestant Bible. It's in what we know as the Apocrypha. But wonderful words. Here they are. Faithful friends are a sturdy shelter. Whoever finds one has found a treasure. Faithful friends are beyond price. No amount can balance their worth. Faithful friends are life-saving medicine. And those who fear the Lord will find them. Those who fear the Lord direct their friendship aright. For as they are, so are their neighbors also. One of the great ends of the church going back to the 1900s in Presbyterian polity and doctrine, is to shelter the shelter, nurture, and spiritual fellowship of the children of God. And that's one of the things that we do together. Shelter, encourage, nurture, fellowship, or friendship of the children of God. So what about you this morning? On this Friends Sunday, who are your friends. Or maybe, more importantly, who, who have been your friends with whom you've lost touch as you look back? Why not reach out and take a risk and say, hey, how are you doing? I miss you. Thank you for your friendship. Today, will you be a friend? Will you be a friend of others to come alongside them, to listen non-judgmentally to affirm God's love, founded in God's love, the relationship, the friendship that is full of grace and mercy. Will you be a friend to Jesus, a friend of Jesus, 
who commands us to love one another. In a few minutes, we'll close our service by singing a hymn that's familiar to many of you, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds Our Hearts in Christian Love. It describes well and simply, in simple words and tune, what it means to be faithful friends together, the joy and the blessing. The story behind it is a fascinating one. It was written in 1782 by a man named John Fawcett. In England, he had been orphaned at the age of 12. He was converted under the preaching of evangelist George Whitfield and called to pastor a poor rural church in Waynesgate, Yorkshire, in which people were farmers, shepherds, many illiterate, many poor. And he and his wife Mary had four children, and they loved this congregation. But there came a day when he was extended a call to a bigger church in London, larger and more refined, more money and prestige. And he accepted that call. And in his farewell sermon saying goodbye, the people were in tears. They loaded the wagons, said their goodbyes. The congregation gathered round, despondent and in tears. And his wife, Mary, then said, I can't do it. I can't leave. John said, I can't either. So they unloaded the wagon to exalted shouts of joy. And they stayed at that church, and altogether he served that congregation for 54 years. Now, was the hymn tied directly from that? We don't really know, but it describes the bond, the tie that binds us one to another in God's great deep love. Sharing mutual woes and burdens, rejoicing with those who rejoice, weeping with those who weep, as Paul says, and and as the words go, and often for each other flows the sympathizing tear. Faithful friends love one another with God's grace and with love. What could be more meaningful? What could be more significant? And isn't that why we're here? In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Amen.